It's nice to see you, Jamie. It's good to be back. First ever return guest. Yep. Well, I'm, I'm honoured. Thank good you. To see you. Yeah, yeah, definitely. So since the last time we've spoke, like especially I think in mainstream media, like <coughs> universal basic incomes became a bit of a sort of hot button topic, and there's a lot more sort of like chat here. I think they they called it the freedom dividend. Yeah. Yeah, that's the that's the spin. That's the, uh, it's uh, much like freedom fries. If you had freedom yeah. in something some, uh, in front of something in America, it's just uh, going to get so much further. So mm-hmm. yeah, uh, but no, definitely it's it's. I think the the level of interest around the world's been fascinating. Um, I think you saw some of the kind of reactions from both sides though to the recent results that came out or preliminary results that mm-hmm. came out from uh, from Finland from yep. the experiment there, um, and you know. It, there was an argument to be made that they were very much the kind of thing that convinced you of what you already knew mm-hmm. uh, in the sense that you had um, a spin from the BBC, which was remarkable, where they said um, basic income experiment in the headline fails to increase a uh, number of people in work. Whereas, of course, the criticism running into the experiment had been that basic income would make less people work. And actually, the initial result yeah. showed that there was no <clears throat> impact either way in terms of working. So suddenly it was amazing how if you, you, you flip it in different uh, directions that can have quite a, an impact in that sense but i think definitely the the level of interest around the world um there's gonna be some stuff coming out in canada at the weekend which i think is gonna be really interesting mm-hmm. uh i think the finnish uh, preliminary results were were fascinating see that impact around uh, potentially well-being and how people view themselves this was, was was it yourself that was in the garden on this one uh yeah so i had something in scotsman and, scotsman and we'd covered a few things in different places mm-hmm. aye. Um, and I mean, you can't get too carried away. It's very much top level stuff. A lot of my, my friends and colleagues who are researchers are uh, quite annoyed that we're kind of getting too excited about it at this stage. But um, I, I think there's there's certainly indications there that show, and uh, you know, I'm not surprised by this, that mm. if you actually trust people, you give them money, you take away the kind of constant conditions and having to justify yourself. Mm. Funnily enough, they have a better view of society, the future and, and their own chances. And you know, I, I think the more that, that that fits with other experiments that we've had, and I think the more we can start to show that, then then the better, because it actually gives you that challenge back of mm-hmm. what kind of world do we want to see? Do we want to actually give people a chance to, to do some interesting things and make some choices for themselves? Mm. What was what were the main sort of outcomes of the finish? I've no really read much. So, I mean, it is very top level stuff at this stage it was a a relatively small survey of participants so i mean the the full results will be out probably next year at some point okay Um, so that's when we'll really see but the the early indications were that um between the two the the test group and the um those receiving the basic income um that there was no difference in working levels so people weren't more or less likely Mm -hmm. to find work uh if they had the the basic income Mm -hmm. style of now obviously this was somewhat the other results that you spoke about absolutely last time you were here um so i mean uh, you know and this was an experiment that was very much only a small group of people who were receiving unemployment benefit effectively they got the conditions removed so they received the the unemployment benefit and they didn't lose it if they moved into work Mm -hmm. um but there were also indications that those who responded to the survey said that they had a better um, conception of their own future. They thought that there were better things ahead of them than those who were participating in the existing system. There was a feeling that people had a better self-reported sense of well-being, that they actually felt healthier and happier having participated in this. Uh, and interestingly, that there was again an, an indication that the, the participants had a higher level of trust mm-hmm. in society and in the government than those who hadn't been participating in the, okay. the system. As I say, can't read too much into it until we get you know full data, but mm-hmm. I think still some some interesting things to to be able to to discuss. And I think they do fit with what we've seen from you know Canada and India and Namibia previously, where mm-hmm. uh, you know it's this idea of if you actually give people a bit of space and you're not constantly hounding them and forcing them to behave in certain ways, you know actually they feel a bit happier about themselves. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Do you th- do you think that the <clears throat> The, the fact that there's a president, an American presidential candidate that's campaigning on the <coughs> universal basic income, do you think that will go a long way of sort of making it more popular, an idea? Because outside of, in the mainstream media, like you're saying the BBCs, and these, they don't really buy into it. They, they kind of... Willfully misrepresent uh, represent it. Yeah, to a certain yeah, definitely. It's almost like free money for the sake of like, give more people more more free yeah. money. Yeah, I mean that's the the instant headline for any 
slightly lazy journalist, isn't mm-hmm. it? Free money. What would you do with free money? You know, it's at the end of the day, it's not free money. It's our money. It's in the system, and it's about where you use that. Um, and to be, you know, what was disappointing about the BBC headline was that the actual article was a, a, mm-hmm. a lot more broad and balanced in terms of showing that there'd been different kind of initial impacts. So mm-hmm. it was just, you know, uh, almost as if a different editor had written the, the headline to the main article. Um, I think, so Andrew Yang, who's the candidate in the, the US uh, for the Democrats, um, I think he's a fascinating guy. I think he's he's approaching these issues from a, a very different perspective. So I think we, we talked about this last time I was on. You know, that in, in the US, there's been a lot of discussion around automation, artificial intelligence, changing mm-hmm. nature of technology, far more so than here in Scotland. The mm-hmm. driver in basic income in Scotland is very much from a kind of social justice perspective, which is great. Uh, you know, from my perspective, I, I fully support that. Mm-hmm. But I think we do need to be talking about some of the impacts that, that changing nature of technology is going to have. And I think mm-hmm. for, for Andrew, his focus has very much come out of that idea that he himself was an entrepreneur. He set up his, his own businesses. And it's about this idea of providing a space and an opportunity for, for people. So I think there's a couple of things that are, that are really interesting to, to his approach. One is um, that obviously he is a complete outsider candidate. He's yeah. picking up a lot of interest. You know, he was in yeah. The Guardian at the weekend. He's been covered in a lot of the major US uh, outlets. Mm-hmm. And, you know, the, the, the indications are that hopefully he might manage to get enough individual donors to make it onto the actual main debate. Now, yeah. obviously, when we say debate, it's going to be more of an arena uh, appearance for yeah, the Democrats, yeah. who the amount of uh, candidates they have to say, but you know, I think he he has a very distinctive pitch within it. Mm-hmm. And whilst his chances of securing the nomination remain incredibly slim, uh, I think the hope is that if he pushes this up the agenda, then other candidates will be forced to to respond yeah. to it. And it started to, to get picked up. Plays on top. Absolutely. I mean, the other thing I think uh, that's that's fascinating uh, with Andrew's campaign is that. Um, He's actually putting his money where his mouth is. So, you know, he's got people in uh, New Hampshire where he is actually paying for them yeah, to receive a basic income. Fu- yeah, he funds a couple of yep. families that he's met. Uh, and now Iowa as well. So, you know, obviously it's playing to the early states and, yeah. and all the rest. But, you know, credit to him. He's willing to, you know, and it's hardly a, a kind of robust scientific experiment. But mm. I think it's it's a really impressive way to say, look, actually I'm going to try this out. I'm willing to see what this, this could do. And I think that level of participation and involvement of people is going to be critical to to any movement forward but i mean we have seen it develop in the us um i think there's a, a in a sense a real benefit but a shame to the fact that a lot of it's come from the big tech guys so like yeah. elon musk you know he's like your quintessential bond villain sits there stroking <laughs> his cat going yo basic income would be great i'm always a bit you know hesitant um zuckerberg basic income, every- basic income will be a human right on Mars. Exactly, <laughs> exactly. Um, maybe. Uh, unless it changed my mind. Uh, you know, Zuckerberg comes out talking about basic income, which is great because he has huge uh, media profile. Unfortunately, mm-hmm. half of what he says isn't quite accurate, so you mm-hmm. just have to correct it afterwards. But, you know, I, th- I think it's interesting it's coming from there, but I think we need to broaden that debate out far more than, than kind of I the think big that's something that appeals to me. I mean, I think when I look at America, and obviously we, we talked a bit about your, your time and work in the UK, <clears throat> We, we kind of touched on the fact that you've spent a lot of time working in America and stuff like that. I think personally, one of the reactions to Trump and, you know, his policies and sort of rhetoric being so right-wing is that for the first time in, I don't know how long I can remember, there is actual radical or what are classified in American terms as radical left-wing ideals being discussed for the first time. Uh, we, we are an actual level of credibility. I mean, and you'll always have the same people that you've always had shouting communism at the top of their voice because that's just their, their stick. But like, as you say, you know, we've got a presidential candidate. We've we talked off mic about the Oscario Cortez and our Green New Deal, and um, that obviously sent them more around, you know, job creation. But then I think that's where the, the you know the, the debate's going to happen is that are we going to stick with old ideas where we talk about employing people in essentially busy work, or do we talk about what quality of life can they have when automation and these other things that you've discussed kind of become prominent. And I think that's quite refreshing. I'm not used to seeing America having very many nuanced conversations on, on this type of thing. So uh, is that something that when you're working in America or you know your colleagues over there are kind of experiencing firsthand? Yes. I, I mean, I think there's challenges because obviously part of Trump's success was that he built a lot of his campaign on 
the old jobs, mm -hmm. you know. So, so he won Pennsylvania on the basis of I'm going to bring back coal. Yeah. Um, you know, has he done? Been, yeah, has you know, he he's brought, not, has he brought back any coal jobs. No, but no. at least he vaguely pretended he had some sort of interest yeah. fleetingly in the people, and that yeah. was that was the issue. I mean, we we discussed off off mic, you know, the there is this kind of presumption about a kind of past from both the left and the right. So mm -hmm. the right see this kind of halcyon days where everything was peaceful there was no crime and frankly everybody had the same skin color and you know same mm. beliefs uh, and the left has this idea of you know the glory days when everybody worked down mines and we were all strong communities but you know the people who worked down mines sadly a lot of them are still fighting for justice for the the, the yeah. kind of health yeah. issues they had growing out of it um and i think there's there's a challenge with that so i think yes in one sense it's it's refreshing to see the diversity of debate in the u.s broaden out um i remember Years ago, back when people used to actually watch Question Time, uh, there was a, a <laughs> former advisor to Bill Clinton was on it. And he said, he, he said, I love coming to Europe, he said, because everybody in, in Europe is a Democrat. Because at that point, obviously, the US sat to the right of most political mm. discussions. And actually, even most Tories in the UK were, would have more affiliated with the, with the Democrats, less so nowadays. Yeah. Um, but I think there's, it'll be interesting to see where it goes. I mean, you have this interesting space where, you know, Bernie Sanders has come back into the race, has raised a lot of money. He's actually seen as not quite as exciting and innovative as he was yeah. four years ago because mm -hmm. actually new people have come on and taken on his, his baton. But I think there are also challenges around what the, this new generation are also looking at. So, you know, that focus on work, I think the, the Green Deal proposed by Ocasio Cortez and others uh, is fascinating. I think it's a real challenge. I think fundamentally, I don't think it's necessarily a, a strict program for government. I think mm -hmm. it's a provocation and a, a challenge to a, a new way of thinking. Yeah, I do think it's it's lacking at this stage around uh, what work means and, and what a good life means mm -hmm. uh, for people. And so I, that's where I hope that, that Andrew Yang's campaign can push that. I suspect there will be pushback from a lot of the Democrats yeah. because I think there is still a, a you know, and you see this in, in UK politics as, as well from the left where this idea that, you know, a job of any sort is the definition of success. But unfortunately, yeah. that's not how we the economy um, works anymore. Ivanka Trump through the week telling us that people didn't want handouts and relation to one of these <coughs> sort of freedom dividends or whatever it was that people wanted to find value in work and you're like, really? Like, it's it's amazing coming you know, from people like, that much money. Yeah, Trump, yeah, yeah. yeah. But like, I, I thought last year, you know, when uh, when President Trump visited Scotland, and I thought, you know, it'd be lovely to meet him mm -hmm. and uh, bounce the idea of a basic income past him because, you know, he had a basic income provided by his, <laughs> his dad. And, trust fund. And yeah, amazing. But this is the thing. We're quite happy to have basic incomes in that sense passed yeah. on from, mm -hmm. from generation to generation. But do you know what? What I would say about uh, Ivanka Trump's... Um, intervention this this week is she's talking about it yeah you know when it's getting to that mm -hmm. stage that she feels the need to i think very inadequately but but respond to it then, yeah. then there's yeah. something positive there mm -hmm. um and i think the challenge will be okay where does that go next where do we start to see uh, work happening around that mm -hmm. i mean the stockton experiments just started in california um okay. i think that's gonna be a really fascinating experiment so you've got a really dynamic young mayor uh, Mayor Tubbs, who's started this uh, experiment there working with the Economic Security Project in the US. Um, and, you know, it's this idea again of how do you, this is a city that was, you know, stagnating and going backwards, huge levels of poverty. And actually, okay. can you give people access to, to a secure income? Does this change their lives? That's going to be a really dynamic and, and exciting opportunity. And I think, you know, the more we see those, there's a very small experiment in uh, Mississippi, I think it's just launched okay. with uh, single mums. In themselves, they're going to be quite small. But, you know, if you start adding these together and you start changing yeah. some of the, the dialogue, I think that's going to be fascinating. I think that's, that's exactly what I'm talking about. I mean, if people are having these wider experiments, these wider conversations, even if it's only filling in a piece of the jigsaw puzzle every time, eventually you should get to the whole picture. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Do you think we'll get to that type of change um, in real lifetime? Do you think we'll see a, like universal basic income? I genuinely think we could do. Uh, I, you know, even a few years ago when I first got involved in this, I would have said it was a provocation. You mm -hmm. know, it was a space for debate. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I think we can. Um, I think here in Scotland, we have a growing space, both politically and civically, 
to have these kind of conversations. I think there's a recognition mm-hmm. that the current mm-hmm. system is is failing miserably. Mm-hmm. Um, I think obviously there are challenges around our ability to deliver on that. So you know we discussed this before. Basic yeah. income is not a policy of the status quo. Um, you know we would have to see changes. Fifteen percent of social security is not enough to be able to to make these kind of changes. And we've seen that with the, mm-hmm. the announcement from the Scottish government of the, the kind of delayed. Uh, changing of some of those those benefits uh, moving forward but I think there's a, a space for it there that I, I would have said was not possible previously um, I think the big things are going to be the requirement to build um, that civic movement so I yeah. think one of the things we've seen in Scotland that's been really exciting is we've had some fantastic political buy-in from you know a range of different political perspectives both locally and nationally and that, that's really positive and it's really important you know when you get to a stage where the first minister's writing in the economist saying i'm really proud scotland's looking to try and experiment with this this is a you know it's a great place to yeah. be in regardless yeah. of your your political position but actually what's been critical is that the politicians are helping to deliver and facilitate this the the movement and the push and the growth is coming from people and yeah. from organizations and, and universities and, and wider communities and i think that's going to be the, the critical bit how do we shape this into something that really matters to people because you could create a basic income, frankly, that is a horrendous libertarian right wing nightmare. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, uh, Rhys Mogg could create a basic income yeah. that we would like, all be in the streets. Universal credit. It's oh, almost yeah. almost there, isn't it? Yeah, it's, absolutely. Uh, I mean, it, and it's fascinating. You you guys said at the beginning about universal basic income. One of the things we find in Scotland is you really have to just uh, pull it down to basic income because as soon as anyone hears universal now, it's they think universal, universal credit. credit. Yeah. And you know, universal credit is such an abomination mm-hmm. and yeah. failure. Um, it's a dilemma. I think it was a dilemma. Yeah, I was going to say it was a Tory tactic. The living but, wage and stuff like that, but it wasn't actually the, the real living wage. It was some that aped on that terminology to, you know, kind of soothe people. And I think I universal did. credit and, uh, you know, universal basic income, I think you've been tagged. In a very sort of similar way in that respect, where they went, but people like the idea of this in principle. Let's hijack it, you know. Well, you know, universal credit was supported across the political spectrum when it was mm-hmm. introduced because the idea of streamlining and bringing together into you know one payment and mm-hmm. you know this all seemed perfectly logical. There was a lot of unnecessary ideological inputs to it. Now, frankly, universal credit would still have been flawed and, and not enough. But yeah. you know, I've I've had people say to me, "Is it not a step towards basic income?" Well, it could have been. You know, without the delay to pick up your, mm-hmm. um, you know, your your first payments, without yeah. the conditionality attached, without you know the clause around children, without but the, the infrastructure the, of how it actually functions it was, could potentially have been I mean, a, a framework for it. Yeah. yeah, it's it's been created as a policy that I think fundamentally is designed to stop people from claiming it because oh, right. that's great. You know, it's much as we said previously about you know, uh, unemployment rates. It's amazing. If you can at least build something as a success, you can come back from this and go, it's fantastic. Well, fewer mm-hmm. people are using benefits and we're cutting money. Well, yeah, you're actually, A, they're not, because, you know, the, the National Audit Office report into to Universal Credit was, was scathing and how mm-hmm. it's failing under Oof. all of its own um, conditions of success. Yeah. And I actually can't even judge most of its own conditions of success. But, uh, but yeah, I think it's, it's a, an inhumane system. And I think, all the evidence and, and all the impact so far shows that it should be, its rollout should be stopped mm-hmm. uh, and, and we should be finding something different. The problem is that because the ideology was there in yeah. the beginning, even though we've had, you know, slight pullbacks from the UK government because it's getting so bad, uh, you know, the indications are still that they're, they're firm. Yeah, I mean, that's the, the road they're on, sort of on an ongoing basis. Yeah, I mean, uh, we may see differences. So uh, John McDonald, the Shadow Chancellor, has commissioned a report by Guy Standing, so leading basic income figure, uh, into what basic income policy might look like for the Labour Party on the UK level. Now, okay. you know, we, we had that period in time where it was impossible there would be a Labour government, followed by, oh, there could be a Labour government, and now back to, yeah, probably never will be again. <laughs> um, but, you know, if, if you could get to a stage where this could be, you know, commitment to experimentation could be a manifesto. Uh, pledge for, mm-hmm. for the Labour Party. New First Minister Wales uh, is is open in support of the idea of experimentation, and two uh, he and one of the other candidates for for Labour leader and then and then mm-hmm. First Minister 
uh, we're both very supportive. There's an event we are supporting down it's in quite a high in percentage June. of candidates. Yeah, and you know, country the size of Wales. Absolutely. So I mean, the, the third candidate was firmly opposed, but you right. know, we we can live with that. But uh, you know, so if you can see Wales, uh, Liverpool City Council passed a motion in favour of experimenting mm-hmm. there. There's a huge interest in Sheffield. There's a UBI lab there that's doing some brilliant work. Um, so you know. It's the kind of space where even a kind of year ago, I would have said Scotland, we had an opportunity that was mm-hmm. being restricted or, or would be restricted because of the nature of the, the devolution settlement and our, our constitutional constructs yeah. just now. Um, but actually, you're starting to see interest from, from across the UK, which changes, you know, if at some point you did have a change of, of UK government mm-hmm. that was open to the idea of, you know, Scottish experimentation, then suddenly it's entirely feasible to take this forward within the UK as, as well as without mm-hmm. it. So, mm-hmm. um, you know, I think there's there's some really interesting stuff there. I've been fascinated, though, in terms of uh, some of the other debates. I was at a conference in, in Portugal in, in January. Yeah, and uh, A, it's uh, incredibly depressing as someone who, having to survive the uh, the nightmare of Brexit. Well, we won't we just now to be in continental Europe where everyone's just kind of <laughs> looking at you like, you've got you doing, you know? Now. Um, but uh, but also uh, the really interesting thing around basic income discussion there was there was quite a pushback to the idea that actually within the EU did you need to look at an EU wide basic income as opposed to individual nations doing it which it was a very different mm. kind of uh, approach to it which certainly has not been one discussed uh, on on this side of the water so yeah you would think that given that benefits and you know social <coughs> security and stuff like that are largely handled you know internally by countries that. Yeah, I never even thought about like an EU wide basic mm. income like that would be some size of project. It would it would have been there's been interest from the, the European Parliament recently, so uh UBIE yeah, who's a campaigning group. Um but yeah, I th- I think it's still fascinating mm-hmm. to see those debates, you know, happening and, and I think taking place in a few different places. The Netherlands currently experimenting with yeah. some spin offs from, from basic I income. Germany or Germany's talking about France. Is, or yeah, like so there's a, a kind of crowdfunded uh, Grunden Common um, project that's been going for a wee while in Germany. Uh, France is looking at, there's a number of um, uh, of areas in France looking just now, particularly uh, Gironde and a few others. Mm-hmm. So, you know, there's there's certainly pockets and, and a lot of interest and kind uh, of continuing to, to face a Brexit. It might be useful for the UK to have something to do when none of us have jobs left. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's um. I mean, it, you time every kind of talk or conversation you have now, don't you? About how far into it you can get with yeah. mentioning Brexit. Mm-hmm. But I, it, I mean, uh, one thing I would say, un- it's become impossible not at this point. I think for a lot oh. of folk, you know what I mean. Like, it's especially the last week or so with the independent group, and you know, it's uh, it's just uh, so up in there that you don't even know, I uh, what direction we're on anymore. So I think the delay. We it's expect th- it to be delayed now, yeah. most likely. It's looking more likely, but mm-hmm. for a couple of months at least, yeah. it will be interesting. Is what are the 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 people that we see going to the independent group? Is there a, an appetite for basic income in that? Because they seem to almost be like the neoliberal. They're going to just be like the Democrats in America. Uh, uh, so I, I don't know about most of them, but I know that Chico Man is <clears throat> uh, strongly opposed to basic income. He gave a frankly ridiculous speech about it last year um where he talked about the dignity of work and how mm-hmm. basic income stripped that away from people because you know and it just was uh, to be honest complete political nonsense yeah, you know, yeah. So it was a sound bite type thing um so i and i mean i think actually i i would and i i, I don't know the standings for for most of that that mm-hmm. group but i would uh, suspect that they'd probably be more likely to propose we find within um within the UK Labour Party, that certainly the kind of centre of the Labour Party tends to have this kind of commitment to the idea of traditional jobs. And Mm. so they don't like basic income in that perspective. Mm -hmm. And then the kind of hard left don't like it because it's a bit too, you're talking about individuals and choice and, you know, that's all about Thatcher. Yeah, it's a bit right wing for them. Whereas I think it shows probably where we are in Scotland in the sense that I would say still, by and large, a lot of the political discussion in Scotland's kind of in between the two. So mm-hmm. it's not quite as hard, yeah. far left as some of the, the kind of Corbyn group is, but it's certainly not to that kind of um, Blairite mm-hmm. centre. So mm-hmm. um, so we find a bit more resonance there where people can see that work's yeah. changing and you need the, the different levels yeah. of support. One of the interesting things that Andrew, what's his second name? Yang. Yang. I don't know why I got it. I thought it was Yong. 
just a letter, I suppose. Um, I work with a lot of Chinese people and working, so it just goes <laughs> into just a, a big um, muddle. Um, he had spoke about the, the average wage. So a lot of people think that basic incomes for the sort of low paid worker. It's the as low paid work goes this will replace it and that's the sort of mind the, the mindset that I've heard people sort of say speaking against it mm. is that this is just going to replace low to medium mm-hmm. but the, the average wage of a truck driver in America is 50k mm-hmm. which is mind blowing so if these are the this is the group that's really under threat and mm. the reason why they're, they're looking at basic income but then the policy is a thousand dollars a month so how do they bridge that gap because it's going to be replacing a 50k job with 12 grand. So I think first and foremost, is, I mean, the, the truck drivers one's a, a critical one. So I think it's 30 out of the 50 states. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Truck drivers are the main, the biggest source of employment, particularly yeah. for, for, you know, kind of white men. Yeah. So it's, mm-hmm. a, it's a huge kind of so demographic. Like nearly issue. like 20 million yeah. people that um, drive for a living in America. Absolutely. And it's, it's going to be hit. You know, I think some of the, the discussions around impact on jobs from automation and AI are overstated. I don't think work's going to disappear. I don't think jobs no. are going to disappear, but they're going to change. And I think that's an industry you can see. Yeah. Where mm-hmm. it, so I think where they, it they had predicted um, when I was reading into it that what would basically happen is in, in, in our city, the truck would be a drone and it would have a person manning the truck while it's in the inner city. But when it goes out to do yeah. the sort of cross country, they'll just all link together and just fire across the country. Yeah. And so it would reduce the workload by like 90%. So yeah. it's still be a 10% workload that would need to be taken by human yeah. beings, but the rest of it would all be automated. And interestingly, of course, so we, we've seen this in some senses before, some of the heavy industry where, yeah. where folk were, were got rid of. Mm-hmm. But actually what you're also seeing with truck drivers is you've got Uber moving into the, the whole uh, logistics and infrastructure market as well. So actually not only do you get rid of the truck drivers, but you get rid of the people who are doing all the logistics work. So suddenly you're hitting kind of traditionally blue collar jobs and white collar jobs. Mm-hmm. Um, because actually you can run most of that off an algorithm. You don't yep. need people doing uh, you know, your timesheets and all these, you know, working out where stuff should be. Mm-hmm. Um, I think in terms of the impact on, on people's wages, and this goes back to this idea of, you know, people won't work anymore, mm-hmm. is it's very rare that people are suggesting a basic income that actually fully supplements wages mm-hmm. in that sense people are talking about a, a basic income that is is giving you a survival rate underneath it that mm-hmm. isn't impacted by moving in and out of work so it's not about you know you may be able to choose to live off the basis of it depending on what level it's set at mm-hmm. but that's a personal choice um but actually it's about setting a, a baseline that people can't fall below Mm -hmm. so yeah if you know if you're earning 50 grand as a as a truck driver then 12 grand a year is not going to solve that problem but it might keep you fed and and pay some of your rent yeah um and i think that's where actually you come back to there's still space within that to to be looking for for work and actually to me the the fundamental nature of work and the the fundamental question we need to be asking is what do we even mean by that Mm -hmm. because we've got so embedded in the idea that work is a nine to five paid employment and that this is the best route to success and out of poverty. And of course, that doesn't work anymore because we're seeing the growing numbers no. of in work poverty. Yeah. But also, it's not how a lot of, you know, a, a lot of people's lives should or, or are functioning anymore. What about caring? What about unpaid work? What about mm. volunteering? What about gig economy? What about moving between different jobs or retraining or trying different things? We keep telling people they need portfolio careers. Now, A, what does that mean? And B, how do you get there if you don't have a trust fund behind mm. you to pay for it? I think one of the big things as well is, is what you know people demand. I mean, if you look at things like the retail sector, it's went through, as you say, that Monday to Friday, 95, opening a Saturday, closing a Sunday, then it was, right, well, we'll, we'll open a Sunday now. And then it's, well, we'll open to 7 o'clock every night of the week, then it's 8 o'clock, and then you go to somewhere like the fort and it's 10 o'clock at night they're open to. So I think obviously as well, just the actual demands on what people want for, you know, goods and services is going to be huge as well that I don't think they consider up until now. Mm-hmm. Well, one of the arguments around basic income is that fundamentally, so Scott Santons talks a lot about this, um, and and be good, good person to get on in future. Uh, he, he talks a lot about the fact, you know, it's, it's the idea of saying no. So basic income gives you enough of a power to say, no, mm-hmm. actually I'm going to try and find <clears throat> something else because that's not suitable for me. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think there's space within it to create some really interesting flexibilities i think there's ways to come back and and i i think it's critical that actually part of this conversation involves businesses and employers because 
this could be a way now you know it doesn't mean that we want to go down the route of say uh, Denmark where they have the the flex security approach where actually it's relatively easy for a business to fire you but you're then given very robust unemployment support and the mm -hmm. idea is that you're protected but so is the business and you know so on I'm not saying we to what extent we want to kind of engage with some of those ideas but mm -hmm. I think suddenly things like zero hour contracts which currently are just toxic because yeah. the balance of power purely sits with the the employer in most cases suddenly you could have a position where somebody could go well actually i quite like the idea of a zero hour contract because sometimes I'm, i want to do a bit of work in this and mm -hmm. other times uh, I, I don't there's also the way to combine jobs i mean one of the big issues we're facing obviously is younger people coming into a, a you know, a workplace where a lot of people are going to be working till, you know, they drop dead, basically. Yeah. Um, how do you start to do that? So this is where ideas around the, the four day working week starts to come in. How do you start to share jobs between mm -hmm. people? Yeah. But actually then you get, so I've got an, an article coming out in uh, Business Insider magazine that says, well, this is a great way for businesses actually to potentially get people in where they can benefit from, you know, younger people bringing new ideas and skills mm -hmm. and still retain experience yep. and, and knowledge of, of mm -hmm. the rest of their their working population and so provide their staff their quality of life yeah mm -hmm. and i think that's that's it because do you know what i again i think within a basic income environment good businesses will become incredibly popular and they will be able to choose really good candidates working yeah. because they mm -hmm. will get the reputation and people will be able to say i want to work here because it's a good place mm -hmm. as opposed to i have to work here because either I've been told by the DWP I have to, I'm going to get sanctioned, or I've got no other choices. I think it's probably one of the, the, the biggest kind of <coughs> largely fictional sort of objections that you're going to face is that for a lot of people, UBI is either UBI or work. And I think obviously in all your discussions so far, uh, that's never been the case. It's, it is about if you want to supplement work, if you want to change your working patterns, your work-life balance, etc. This is something that will help you facilitate that in a much better way. But is there, I mean, is, is that an objection you've come up to when you're, you're kind of talking to people? How, how is it you overcome that? How is that going to get out to sort of people out there so that they don't believe it's yeah. one or the other? Yeah, I, I, it does come up. And I, I think that's partly been fueled by some of quite a small proportion within the basic income kind of field who have talked about you know the post-work utopia where mm -hmm. robots will do everything and will be fine if that ever happens i think it'll be you know far far in the future and actually a lot of robot movies they end up trying to wipe us out anyway <laughs> um <laughs> which is the other objection you get but uh no for me i, I fundamentally well, think sorry that, what the robot uprising is yeah. a legitimate Oh yeah, totally. I mean, I, I anytime I talk UBI, well, you know, it just Sky encourages it. It encourages them to come back and get <laughs> us, you know, because uh, if we didn't have a basic, yeah. but I, you know, we we use. I, I often will put up the pictures of um, you know the the nice cute robot from uh, Buck Rogers and then uh, <laughs> then the Terminators, yeah. Beedy, and it's like, which way are we going to go? R two D two. R two D two. Everybody <laughs> likes R two. But uh, yeah, no, I I think it does come back to me. Um, I, I would argue that basic income is fundamentally a pro-work mm -hmm. policy, but work in the broadest sense. So it's not it's not by definition a pro-paid employment because it's about giving people choice. But also, and this comes back to what I've seen, you know, that, that I've, I've given talks in, in Scotland where people stand up and go, you're just a, a libertarian trying to destroy the welfare state. And I'm like, well, actually, this is separate from the welfare state anyway. Mm -hmm. But also, you know, my argument would be I'm trying to help save it. But yeah. Uh, but it also misses the the point to me because this is about giving people choice. But it's I, I've never understood the political dichotomy where people go, I'm either, you know, I'm pro the state and anti individuals individualism, or I'm pro individualism and anti the state. To me, by definition, we're we're a combination of the two. Yeah, yeah. balance we, exactly. And a basic income, by definition, says you're getting this because you're part of something bigger. You can only get a basic income because of the other people in society with you but we also are giving you a space to make choices for yourself rather than us telling mm -hmm. you how to do it and that is probably the biggest struggle people have within the political yeah. sphere within scotland because the level of of paternalism in scotland mm -hmm. is is incredible across the board I think the, like, the notion of a nanny state is the real thing that yeah. we need to let go of is know that the services that are associated to that you know nanny state is the mentality of being nanned by the and state let's, that we let's need to let face go it, most politicians and I, I say this with great love for many many politicians but 
uh, most politicians love a nanny state. They just use it the term about the nanny state they don't personally agree with. Yeah. So you know, I don't like a nanny state that gives people money when they're they're unemployed because that's morally coddling them. But I also like a nanny state that's going to tell people what they can look at on the internet. Or you know, mm -hmm. I like a nanny state that that gives everybody social protection throughout their life. But I don't like one that's going to you know do X, Y, or Z. And yeah. I think that's where it's it's about. It is a challenge mm -hmm. to to let people make choices, and people will get that wrong, mm -hmm. you know, and that's that's okay. Yeah. But I, we're we're not. We've had such a strong media pushback against that idea over over recent decades that people are are fundamentally not. Yeah, to be we're almost like indoctrined into this way of like we're so far into capitalist sort of consumerism and individualism that it's almost like shocking <coughs> to try and. We'll not even try to wind it back, but introduce something different because I think basic incomes like apolitical. Though I mean, even though it's became it came from the right, um, I see it. It almost confuses politicians because they they see it as something. No, we don't like that. And then when it's explained, it's like uh, it's almost like they like the idea of that, but I can't really say that because it's on the surface. I don't agree with it. I just yeah. don't agree with it. And it's it it is. Going, I think this is part of something that we're going to face in the future as new ideas come in that are not of the left or of the right. Obviously, that it's almost, I think maybe it might get lost in the political sort of Yeah, the back and forth. Yeah, yeah. yeah, definitely. I mean, I, I find with, with doing public talks on this that you will inevitably get people who will stand up at the end and go, so if I can just paraphrase, what you're saying is we need socialism or we need communism. Yeah. And, you know, you hear Andrew Yang talks about this as a way to, excuse me, to, to save capitalism. Mm -hmm. And I, honestly, my kind of uh, response to both of those is we're talking about a new century, a new world we're moving into at high speed. We need a new economy and we need new ways of thinking. I don't think the answer in future is either communism or, or no, the capitalism no. we've had. It's so, about the new ideas. Yeah, um, and, and perhaps the combination of both. Yeah. Take yeah. the good ideas of the left, the good ideas of the right, and the good ideas of the centre, and just melt well, them. We've seen some in. some great stuff, and a lot of it coming out of Scotland. So um, Catherine Trebek has a, a new book out about. Uh, so she's involved with the Wellbeing Economic Alliance, with this mm -hmm. new global movement around uh, kind of a new approach to the economy, and, and her book's called uh, Arrival: The Politics of Arrival. And the idea there is, we've arrived as an economy. We have more than enough money to be doing virtually everything we want to do. We mm -hmm. can pay for basic income. We can pay for yeah. a lot of these things. Of course. We just choose not to. So yeah. actually the change isn't about, you know, more growth, less growth or so on. It's about hey, we're doing really well here. What what how do we do this differently in a way that can can actually benefit people? Yeah. And I think those kind of of challenges to to mentality are really difficult for people to to accept. But I think they're also going to be where we start to get some some really exciting opportunities. Yeah, I mean, with things like the NHS and and you know that, that you know, nanny state we've talked about was initially you know launched. I mean, that was something that although it was a great idea and is now universally sort of loved and you know. I would like to say respected, but probably no by a lot of our politicians and stuff like that. But uh, that was a really radical idea oh, yeah. that has been <clears throat> now the, you know, one of the sort of cornerstones of our entire society. You know what I mean? Like, and I think we need those big ideas now. Uh, you should talk that transition into the new, the new century. Um, and again, harking back to the, the Cortez Lassie and our Green Deal, like, I get that it's obviously a pure massive bit of legislation, but as I was saying, we don't really get to take it up with just yet, but I think as a, a kind of like, you know, first over the fence type thing. It's, I, I'm quite happy with it in a sense because I think it's reassuring that people out there are actually having yeah. big ideas and trying to find these sort of platforms because the minutia, the, you know, daily back and forth, uh, I but what about what he said, what about what he said, let's get this fucking nowhere. Yeah. You know what I mean? And, um, I the more big ideas, the better. They're not going to work, though. But no, but and also the next time someone suggests <coughs> something along those lines, it won't seem quite as big and yeah. shocking as the first time it happened. <coughs> uh, I, mean, I, mean, I think that's that's critical. I think it is about starting to try things out. And the NHS is a great example. It comes mm. back a lot to us because one of the biggest debates just now is around the idea of should we be experimenting with basic income or not? Because mm. actually, within the basic income movement, there's a lot of argument that says uh, experiments can be really dangerous or they certainly don't prove much more because you can't test basic income because a lot of it's um 
its, its core components are long term. So mm-hmm. if you know it's going to end in two years, you're not going to necessarily cut your working hours, which if you knew it was there forever, you might do. So, you know, you're, yeah. you're limited anyway. Mm-hmm. And the example comes back with the, the NHS. We didn't pilot the NHS. We didn't say, should we try this out for a couple of years and see what happens? We went, do you know what? This is a good idea. Let's go with it. Now, I personally think there's something uh, beneficial to the fact that, frankly, we're not in a position where we can deliver basic income just now. So I actually think the discussion around experimentation uh, is really useful because it allows us to be continuing that that development. And we will be in a far, whatever happens with, with potential experiments in Scotland, mm-hmm. we'll be in a far stronger place for future policy making than we would be if we weren't having the discussion. Mm-hmm. Uh, but yeah, at some point, we also just need to be radical and get on with it because there's too much discussion about stuff that's kind of just... Then One of the things that I've kind of encountered a bit when we've looked at like previous examples, uh, some of the sort of Nixon era stuff that you talked to us about in the previous episode, I had a read up on, and the various ones subsequently. But <coughs> the, I, I've always been struck by how small some of the numbers are. So 200 here, 300 there, you know, a certain section, of, mm-hmm. as you say, single mothers or college graduates or whatever it is yeah. that it happens to be. And I'm like, what, what kind of scale do you think we would need to have an experiment in, say, something like Scotland? for it to really be a, a definitive answer that we go for it? So I think fundamentally there won't be any definitive mm-hmm. answers, and that's really annoying, but it's just kind of the, the, mm-hmm. the truth. I mean, I think within Scotland, we've we've had initial discussions around there's four potential experimental areas. Could you have 2,000 people per area? That's 8,000, mm-hmm. suddenly substantially bigger than, than most other experiments. Uh, I mean, Finland was 2,000 people, uh, but spread across the country. So I think, again, it depends on, on what, uh, mm-hmm. format it takes so if you have something in a, a town in fife for example where you get the kind of community interactions and and playing off each other then actually you know a thousand two thousand people can be really powerful uh, okay. findings out of that um, i mean i i think some of the most uh, fascinating results that there have been to date with the manitoba experiments especially mm-hmm. dolphin which um which were carried out over there uh, with Evelyn Forge and I th- or Evelyn Forge, I'm kind of re- reviewing the data, and I, I think they're fascinating because it's that community interaction. So Finland was always going to be limited by the fact it was just people getting unemployment benefit, and actually one of the things I'd, I'd heard from people involved was because they were receiving the same money. Um, actually, some of the people who were on the experiment didn't even know they were part of it because they got out a letter from the Finnish Social Security Agency, Kela, saying you're now in this experiment. They got an envelope that said Kela, and they were like, I'm not opening that, and chucked it in the bin, you know. So because their money didn't change, <laughs> they, had, they had no idea. So, you know, it was always a, a very particular type of experiment. The, the Canadian experiment in Ontario would have been interesting because it mm. was actually going to be paying at a significantly higher level mm-hmm. than, than standard yeah. benefits. Um, and obviously, it's it's incredibly disappointing that, that that was cut by the the Ford administration there. But I think what's been really fascinating has been the the civic response to that. You know, okay. and that's something that I think here in Scotland we're learning a lot from because it's about well, how can you build that in from the beginning rather than wait for something bad to uh, to happen with mm-hmm. it. But I think if we could be talking uh, in the thousands in Scotland, and if we could be looking certainly for I would hope for at least one geographic type experiment then Mm -hmm. then i think it would be great part of the reason they end up more focused is ease and uh and finances yeah so you know we we had a session recently uh with a a leading basic income uh thinker uh, jürgen de vichler who uh was talking about you know we we got to the end of it and we're like scotland's probably one of the most tricky places to actually run this because of the interactions of benefits and taxation and Mm -hmm. devolution and reserve powers and all the rest Mm -hmm. So minefield, it? It, it is. Mm-hmm. So I think that might mean that we have to focus in a little bit because that's just the only way to do it. Mm-hmm. But I think, you know, the, the way that certainly the, the feasibility group have started from is you, you start with your perfect and you compromise just as much as you need to to get it to happen, mm-hmm. uh, you know, rather than starting the, the other way around. I've got to say, a couple of thousand or so is, is probably a smaller number than I thought would have been the case. But then that's, you know, how well I know about it, really. I think it's it's just the the as I say the cost and the complexity mm-hmm. uh, add up. I I would suspect we see you know we'd be talking in the thousands over probably two to three years. Mm-hmm. Um, so it would be it would be small scale, but I think you know. Uh, For anybody uh, listening to this, I'm going to please sign up to volunteer. It this is what it comes We've uh, we've been doing some work <laughs> in five years around the block. Absolutely, <laughs> every conversation comes back to, and is it our town that you'll be uh, running this in? Um, and that that'll be one of the. Uh, it the just shows you the the appetite for it. And sort of normal people, I think. Oh, yeah. Like, f- I, I work retail, 
Um, I've I've sort of hit that sort of the as high as I'm going to go in the retail sort of like I get, I get a decent wage and I can survive, I suppose. Um, but the the if you were to say to everybody that works in my shop, you get a three thousand pound a month. I think all of them would reduce their hours. I think every yeah. single person that works would be like, I'm going to, I'll go part time. That'd be mm. amazing. And myself included in that. <laughs> and I enjoy my job. I mean, yeah. I don't, yeah. I, 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 I enjoy working with the public. I enjoy helping people. But um, it's just the 40 hours a week and the sort of 95. It's just, it's, it's boring. Also, it's you fucking enjoy boring. other stuff. Do you know what I mean? It doesn't. Oh, this well, is the thing. Is I it, love other stuff. But do you know what I mean? Yeah, I enjoy, I enjoy my job, but I love doing other things. But also, it's really interesting. You didn't say, "Oh, if we got this, everybody would be out there." You said people would cut their hours. People yeah. would do that and other things. Mm -hmm. And I think that's where the fascinating. What would? Can you imagine the impact we could have in a society where people were actually doing things they loved and things that paid the bills, yeah. rather than you know? Yeah. I think like companies. What I think one of the the main things that would excite me would be companies like Sports Direct not being able to find people to start at half five in the morning on a zero hours contract. <laughs> people just turn around and go, do you know what? Shove your job. Well, I said earlier, you know, good employers would mm -hmm. would benefit. Yeah. Yep. Bad employers would have to start shaping up a lot more. Um, and I think what you would probably see is that in some of those areas and actually in some, uh, some full industries, so, you know, we have this ridiculous situation where we want our kind of elderly relatives, if they're in care, to be looked after to the top possible degree. And we get outraged rightly when it when it doesn't happen. Mm -hmm, yeah. And we also pay people working <clears throat> in the care industry some of the lowest wages in the country. I think you'd suddenly see some of these industries seeing a bump because mm -hmm. actually, do you know what? I don't need to be doing this if you're not yep. going to support me. So that, that's going to be a push to them. And frankly, it should be. Yeah. Um, you may then, as I say, see other industries where popular you know, progressive, supportive businesses are actually going to become quite popular places to work. Yeah. And so they're going to be able to have a, a bigger choice of, of candidates and people to work with. I think it would be as, as well, you know, for me, I, I couldn't see why it wouldn't be the end of like poverty wages. Because if people had the choice whether or not to actually come to jobs, like you say, whether it be zero hour contracts or early mornings or whatever, mm -hmm. you know, the notion that you're coming in and you're earning, you know, minimum wage plus a penny, you know, I think the the, the competition that then, mm. as you say, would come as a result of companies having to up their game would mean that, you know, the wages that were out there would probably go a lot further as well. Yeah, I think it also shows that, and this is one of the things, you know, it's so important to re-emphasise wearing basic income. And it's one of the attacks that we get. Basic income doesn't solve every problem, so it's not worthwhile doing. Mm. No po policy ever has and ever will, mm. you know. But actually, sometimes basic income people make it sound like it's, you know, a, a utopia. Yeah. Of course mm. it's not. Basic income is a foundation that we build on top of. <clears throat> mm -hmm. yeah. And so what you said, I think, is is entirely plausible as long as we retain robust living wage on top of that. So, you mm -hmm. know, I've, I've had sessions before where someone's gone, I'm, you know, particularly I'm from the right and this is brilliant because we could scrap minimum wage. And it's like, no, because then a, a basic income would just be a, a supplement for employers. Yeah. To, you know, so Which a basic is pretty income... pretty much what we've got just now yeah. within the welfare system yeah, totally. is, is that we supplement a lot of wages. So basic income is in addition to an accurate living wage. Mm -hmm. You know, basic income connects into conversations around rent control because you have to have something around rent control or basic mm -hmm. income just vanishes into to private landlords' yeah. pockets. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And this... You know, this makes it slightly more complex. One of the things that people like about basic income is it seems dead easy. You give people money, that's it, you're done. It, as from a policy perspective, it has to be more complex because it has to have interactions with the tax system within mm. revenue how, how generation. How many MPs or landlords again? <laughs> yeah. Just yeah. on the on the, the rent control stuff. Yeah, I was that's listening, what I mean. listening to a podcast the other day uh, of a guy in Ireland, and he was saying that they've given blanket planning permission to homeowners in Ireland to build like log style cabins in their back gardens to rent out to people because it's so difficult for you to find property in Dublin. Yeah. So anybody <coughs> that owns their house in Dublin can go and build a shed basically in their back garden that. to yeah. start to rent out. And I, my girlfriend lived in London. She said she knew people that would live in garages yeah. in the bottom of people's back gardens yeah. like Monday to Friday and then go back home to their family and their home wherever in the north and commute back down and stay in a garage. Yeah. It's like no way to fucking live. I've no. seen, a, I've seen a tweet that I thought initially was a joke, and it was about the, the Irish housing situation, and it was one of these kind of like 
rate my place type of things. I think the Metro does an article, you know, here's what I get for how much I pay type chat. Yeah. And it would somebody posted a picture of just a, a living room and there's the couch there and behind the couch there's a one man tent and he was like, This is two hundred euros a month. For the uh, tent? This is a tent at the back of somebody's couch in the living room. And I was like, surely that's a bam up and then looked in it was like, right, okay, fair enough. And then I seen another one, it was a, a house went up in Dublin and the people that were there to view the house were like somebody had videoed it and walked in walked in the crowd. Yeah. Away down the, out the garden, away the down amount the street, of people waiting to go and view a private like a one bedroom house or whatever. Oh, it's yeah, it's crazy. I mean, uh, and it's it's one of the biggest challenges because ultimately, with the basic income, you would want to roll housing benefit into it for mm -hmm. simplicity's sake, and there's just no way you can do it. Because if we did, you'd either have a basic income that would be utterly insufficient for people living in love, London, Edinburgh, yeah. or even you know Aberdeen, um, or you'd have one that was so generous to the rest of us. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know, we'd have a surplus. Oh, it'd be yeah. incredible. I mean, I, the, the costs in, in the big cities are a huge issue. I mean, Berlin mm -hmm. just now starting to, there's been a huge pushback against both gentrification concepts and hipsters but also um the the, the rent because traditionally you know berlin and, and german cheap, cities cheap, well they're they're renting cities you don't own um mm. you know and actually there's been a big pushback because because of that they've, they've pushed prices up so much and actually you see people power responding to it we don't seem to have that same level of indignation around it uh, here and i think that's going to be a, a mm. critical aspect is i mean it, it, rent control has been discussed here in glasgow and you know the mm -hmm. place and i think they will inevitably have to be to be looked at um but i think that does come back to this idea of well, okay well if we had basic income as the foundation stone what else would need to change yeah, around if it? if we yeah. just introduce a, a a rent control just now it would make a difference to people's lives don't get me wrong yeah. it, would, it would have an impact would it make a much bigger impact if that was built on top of a basic income that gave them the security in between times as well. Mm. So you know your rent's safe and controlled and you know you have access to finance to be able to pay for mm. it. It's like the argument about wages versus inflation, isn't it? Where if you're earning X <coughs> amount, you know, £1,000 a year um, and you know you get a 1% rise, but inflation's at 2 you you've essentially got a pay cut. You know I mean? like, and if you're giving or, you know, providing people access to the money <coughs> they've contributed to society... But then, as you say, a landlord hoovers it up, then it's an exercise of futility. Absolutely. Absolutely. And there, that's going to be critical aspects, for, <laughs> particularly for policy rollout, if this was to become an, an actual living policy. But mm -hmm. even for the experiments themselves, I think we'll need to look at how do you have those those interactions with some of the existing mm -hmm. systems. The the American guy who I watched him speak, he'd said that there would be a system where his idea was if you're rich enough, you don't need to accept it, but you you can give it to charity. Um, I was thinking more along the lines of, so I was thinking what happens to sick people within the basic income model? Because he was citing numbers about basically just wiping away welfare. He was, he was incorporating that in the cost mm -hmm. of basic income is that we spend X, we spend this amount of money on welfare, that would go. Mm -hmm. And I was thinking what happens to people that can't work if mm -hmm. it's supplementing wage, but they don't get a wage. Yeah. Would that mean that people would essentially lose their benefits? And if that was the case, would it be, do you think it would be a, an idea if you were rich enough to not give it to charity, but to give it to a person that needs it rather than, or would that, do you think that would be dehumanising if you were basically going, you're paying for a sick person? Yeah. And almost like putting the advert, I could see the advert on the TV yeah, yeah. replace the African mm -hmm. sort of famine adverts with, look at the sick person in yeah, yeah. Scotland, why Donated. don't you give them your basic income? And Yeah, and it, it's been an interesting one because it's been brought up a few times, you know, could, this idea of could, could uh, higher earners donate their basic income. Uh, and at the end of the day, it would be their income, so they could choose to, to do with it what they, they wanted. I think it's worth pointing out that obviously a, a basic income as a policy would involve a progressive taxation system that would mean higher earners wouldn't be benefiting financially from it anyway. Mm -hmm. they, they would receive the income through the, into their, their bank every month because I think there's an important societal connection that comes out of that. Mm -hmm. But actually, they would be paying more in taxation that would pay for it and they, therefore they wouldn't, uh, they wouldn't benefit. Mm. I mean, I think... <clears throat> That's where the right comes in and goes, we don't like it anymore because you're of course not tax the rich. Of course not. But you know what? We've got so... But it's tax, immigrate... We've allowed ourselves to be... to give up to the media misrepresentations. Yep. I had someone... I, I was in... Uh, radio 4 recently and you know someone said oh but um 
you know, you need to be very careful with this because, you know, the Daily Mail will attack it. And I was like, do you know what? I'm fed up with the fact we give up to the Daily Mail. Of yeah. course it's going to attack it. That's a good sign. You know, yeah. if it says yeah. this is a good idea, then we need to rethink it. Right, the Daily Mail's attacking you, you're probably doing something Exactly. Right. But, mm. you know, so I, I think we need to, and I agree, I think people will, will push back against it, but you need to, to explain this is an investment in society. I think in terms of people with, with illness, with disability and, and these issues, is that there will be, so although basic income in most representations so some people argue basic income is just a new thing on top of everything else that exists mm -hmm. most uh, models wouldn't say that they would roll in things like child benefit and a lot of existing benefits mm -hmm. usually housing benefit as i say is kept separate just because of the sheer complexity mm -hmm. yeah but also basic income is a societal right and a societal benefit Something like disability is is individual by definition. It has to, you can't just kind of make up a, a kind of arbitrary thing. You have to respond to people's individual needs, and I think it's the same with 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 illness within that. That there would be a, a complementary system that supports people in those particular situations. But of course, the thing with the basic income is that if you were sick, you would still be receiving your basic income without needing to prove yeah. any sort of um, of activity around. <clears throat> workplace or anything like that so mm -hmm. for example if you were receive if you were employed and you were receiving sick pay you would still be receiving your basic income uh, alongside that so it would still give you a better basis to it than a, you know as opposed to many of the the mm -hmm. horror stories we've seen of you know people dying with cancer being in job coaches or uh, yeah forced them um, to work being you know winning appeals about fitness to work you know weeks after you've died yes yeah let's even then it's that. not a given to be honest so. no Mm. Uh, so no I, I i think it's an important one i mean we find uh with work we've done before that quite often um in an initial conversations disability groups can be quite negative about basic income from a very understandable reason which is they say society has is not prepared for us to have an equal place in it so we need additional support how can you take that away and and you know we're, mm. once you have that discussion though of no this would still exist um, I think the other thing is uh, it's very important to emphasise. You know, we, we mentioned earlier about uh, the welfare state. You know, certainly for me and the work that we've done, basic income is completely separate to the welfare state. So, uh, basic income is about social security. So, from our perspective, and, and just very strongly from my perspective, we're not talking about the NHS and, and mm -hmm. education and areas like that having any sort of involvement in terms of of removal of, of services. I think ultimately you would get to a stage where uh, a basic income I think would lead to um, savings within it because I think if you improve people's physical and mental well-being they're going to have less use of, yeah. of many of the, the services that are provided mm -hmm. but fundamentally basic income is not a cost saving exercise because basic income is a, an investment. It will cost money and that's okay. I you know I think it's intended we've, to. Yeah. We yeah we've got too used to the fact that the amount of money we have um, given to the city of London and financial institutions to to bail them out over recent years, which has been shown to not only have no benefit to the rest of the UK but actually has a detrimental impact on mm. on the economy of the UK, would have paid for a basic income style you know yeah. provision for every person in the country. Uh, you know the the cuts to corporation tax, the 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 money that we miss through tax evasion every year. You know yeah. there there's a number of places as you know it goes back to what we said about you know Catherine Trebet's arrival we've got lots of money there's a magic money tree out there it's, yeah it appears just, whatever it's needed it. that's that's what, yeah whenever they need it they can get it but yeah. um when when they don't need it they don't, oh it suddenly it suddenly just, vanishes they they the, it. we've talked about it in an episode of the week there the, the Panama Papers documentary I don't know if you've seen it when you talk about that magic money tree yeah. and they're saying that these companies in and around the you know the Panama Canal uh, had something like you know close to a hundred trillion dollars just squirreled away, oh, yeah. and you're like, imagine what you could, the good you could do with a hundred trillion plus dollars. I saw a tweet the other day. It said, "Do you remember when we all were outraged about the fact that effectively the highest earners on the planet were engaged in a criminal conspiracy to you know keep money out of the the global financial systems? Do you remember what happened with that? Yeah, nothing, nothing. nothing. Um, yeah, we get. I think that the. When when did the Panama Papers get outed? So like 2014? I think it was Aye, like in that, 2014, in that 2015, and then Brexit happened in 2016, Trump yeah. came along in 20... Mm. So it's, it, it almost it seems well, nicely timed with yeah, all yeah, this political... I'm pretty sure the EU is bringing through uh, new regulations on offshore investments. Yeah. yeah, so this is like a rejection of that. I mean, yeah. It's these ones where you think, you know, I, I, I'm never one for conspiracy theories. I, I automatically get quite suspicious mm. of any of them, but... Uh, 
there's a few that unfortunately some of the the evidence starts to pile up. Yeah. Now, you know, Trump as a as a Russian spy. What a ludicrous concept that the U.S. president could be, you know, enthralled to the yeah, to an enemy state. The man for uncle. And then you look at it, and you're like, no, no one has done more damage to the U.S. power <laughs> in the planet than, than it's Trump has. A really bad spy move. They're yeah. like, we're going to replace the American president with a Russian spy, and it's like a guy with like pure shady makeup and yeah, you hair know, that flaps. Eye, all. Like, you know, the, the, the men for uncle come in and kick his ass and put the real president back mm. in. But that, that's happening. Which of course the, the real men for uncle. Yeah. Well, I mean. He saw his the debacle in in Vietnam uh, with with Kim Jong Un. I mean, talk, for a man who's you know the the skill he takes pride in is supposed to be his ability to negotiate. A good yeah, deal. and he came away with hee haw. And uh, yeah, you know nothing. We were and, talking. I was talking to a guy yesterday. Who was saying really quite interesting. If see when you can go into your betting app and look mm-hmm. at your plus and minus for the last twelve months. If if we had the same thing for Trump and just click lifetime. And see where his plus and minus is. I'm <laughs> gonna bet that it's gonna be minus a lot. Oh, of I think the Democrats, like. now that they're in control of Congress, are getting quite close to, particularly like in, in New York. I think they're trying to mm. get at his tax returns and stuff like that, and they're now looking at ways to prosecute him potentially outside the states <coughs> because he can he can pardon himself yeah. technically. But if they do it at a state level rather yeah, than a federal right. level, then it, it doesn't have the ability and stuff. The like things that. the things I would say about that. So, I, I mean, I, I think. Trump is a, a disgrace to the, the office of president mm. and, you know, so many reasons you would disagree with him. I think there's a real danger of, of um, chasing impeachment for the Democrats, mm. I think. Um, partly because I think generally people don't particularly like it. It always feels like you're victimising someone, mm. I think, rightly or wrongly. I think there's that feel of you're, you're going after him for political gains. Mm. Um, I think running towards a presidential election, I think the chances that uh, timing-wise it would hold... Trump back from a re-election campaign, I think it would invigorate his base yep. massively, yeah. whereas actually Definitely. some of them are getting a bit scunnered with him. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, and I think fundamentally, Trump is is awful. Trump is is, is terrible pre- president. He's so utterly chaotic, though, that he has done some really bad things within mm-hmm. the US context. But actually, he's also created a hell of a lot of problems for US. You know, he controlled every layer of government, yep. which isn't really supposed to happen. And actually, didn't change. You know, there's more. You know, the the Republicans have control of of uh, of, the, of the Supreme Court. But, mm. You know, ultimately, he's not reshaped America to that extent that he could have done. I I think Mike Pence as president, you would he would potentially be less dangerous to the less rest of the world. But I think your your step towards you know. Hamid's tail Gilead would take a, yeah. a massive step yeah, forward. Cause I think bad news for women and gays and all the rest. Well, of yeah. in the next. I think there mm. would be a fundamental drive to to use the power that. And again, the the midterms have changed this dynamic <clears> because <throat> now there is checks and balances back in place, which means that fundamentally not much will yeah. happen, as has been the case. I think for, the answer for, for the Democrats is find a candidate that is everything that he's not like. Clinton wasn't really there in that respect, like a, a Kamala Harris or you know Cory Brooker or whatever it is that can go up and go toe to toe in a debate and actually just show the world the, the the absolute charlatan that he is, rather than just letting him sit there going wrong and you know the, those yeah. debates where Clinton yeah. became and and a lot of places in America that that's, that's still won and lost in the debate. Oh, yeah. um, so I, I'd love to see somebody go up there, particularly you know like a woman of color, and just bitch slap him about for like 90 minutes at a time and I think at the end that you'd see just the kind of spoiled brat child that he is and yeah. I, think I think that's enough to get a lot of folk who are the line room in that respect I think that and a positive vision I mean I think hmm. at the end of the day you can you can make fun of it but make hmm. America great again the irony was of course America was doing pretty well I mean yeah. lots of its communities yeah. are not doing well that's the difference America doesn't need to be great it's mm-hmm. all of America yeah. needs to be great much as we have here yeah, like but get a there. similar sort of problem <coughs> here where it's almost like <coughs> economically they're doing quite well, but people. I mean, I, I feel, I, I feel like I have not actually like. It's been ten years since I've felt like a, a sort of wage rise happening. Yeah. So mm. that's what's happening across the board. Like I said I'm pretty well paid. So if you're in a minimum wage yeah. job, how must it feel? I mean, it's go to te- period go to of stagnation and. Hundreds of years, isn't it? Yeah. In terms of so, like, like almost since like the Victorian age. This is the problem: is is that he came in in this sort of make America great again sort of wave, um, with people getting excited about this is going to be the, the, the change, the same sort of thing yeah, that, that Obama, Obama did, that Obama did yeah. as well. But 
now he's citing numbers about look at the amount of jobs I've created, look at how great the economy's doing. But the normal people just if, if you hear a scratch, there's a cat kicking about somewhere. The normal people just only feeling this no. change, and it's same in this country as Absolutely. well, where they go unemployment's at a record low. Yeah, that's, that's great, but yeah, we're fudging the numbers. But but also, and it's it's national figures. GDP yeah. goes up. Child great. poverty is going through up. the roof. We just ignore the ones that they don't have. And the point is, and and sometimes we need to have these conversations. And I think one of the things is we we are cowardly in a sense. So we won't talk about the fact of do you know what certain industries are dying mm. and have died, and coal shouldn't really come back yeah. because actually, mm-hmm. if we're going to address climate change, this is not the way to do it. Uh, you know, certain communities are struggling because actually there are more attractive things elsewhere and people yeah. don't know. We need to be able to have those conversations, but we also need to not follow them. So currently what we would do is we pretend that's not happening and then we ignore the people. And so the lucky ones escape mm. and the others get left behind. Yeah. And so when you, the more you tell people, aren't we doing so well, the more they go, I sure as hell don't feel it. Because they're right. That's the problem is these communities... We're, from my perspective, they're, they are fundamentally right in their feeling of disconnect and anger. Yeah. What I disagree with is where that has then been channeled. Yeah, and it comes back to these the ideas. In a certain respect. As much as I feel sympathy for the coal you know, community, it, people have built towns and lives and families <coughs> around it, I get that there's a real sort of human cost to it. Um, in terms of like Trump and you know the, those types of policies, that sort of paternalism, protectionism that we're getting for these industries, it's mental that I think that he went out and campaigned on coal, which I think at the at the time was like seventy, eighty thousand jobs across America. Yet he was actively bashing and looking to you know kind of by result undermine like the green energy yeah. sort of market in America. Which I think at this point is now six, seven hundred thousand jobs. So I mean, you're talking about like a, a nine, ten to one ratio in favour of, you know, people working in the green energy industry. And I'm like, I don't, I don't get what the 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 maths, the political maths there was in that well, one either. I think Isn't like he he used Alex Jones really, really well. He was phoning into Infowars, and and I think that we were talking about conspiracy theories. He realised that there's a lot of people in America that are into conspiracies, and so he preyed on that. Mm. So he, he's come out and used the sort of uh, anti-climate change mm. because that is a big conspiracy theory. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so he's come out and he and he's backed that. And this is when th- these people have went, "This is my guy," mm. because he's talking and they say, "I've watched this YouTube video. Climate change is a load of shit." No, this, this, this guy represents, I think it's yeah, like so a... So he picked up for all the small groups. And yeah, it's a lack of representation of real people. That, yeah. That's the mm. problem. And he's uh, said the right things to make people feel that they're going to be represented. But when he's got in, he, did, he yeah. represents himself and his yeah. mates. And but he's legitimised it as well. So we've seen that particularly with, with the far right and mm. racism. That, you know, oh. the ability to now go... What I'm saying is not extreme. What I'm saying is what the President of the United States of America is saying is a huge step right, forward. Yeah. And there's a reason that you've seen the kind of uh, growth again of, of the far right, or certainly the, the visual kind of uh, recognition of the far right again. Because mm. they've, they've badged themselves all the shit about alt right and this yeah. nonsense. You know, it's, it's clever. It's, you know, these are people who are thinking it through. And I, I don't know if you saw that program that was on uh, Sleeping with the Far Right. Um, I've I've seen an article about it this morning. I was yeah. like, I need to need to watch it's, this uh, one. Uh, it's it's painful. You kind of want to throw stuff at the TV. She has far <laughs> more patience than I do. I've said to help them, but um, but they're they're all linked. You know, in the course of this program, he talks to David Duke from the, the KKK in the US, and he talks oh. to you know Nick Griffin, who I didn't even know was still on the scene, but apparently still hiding under a rock somewhere. You know, and. Uh, you know, this is the thing that again is not so. There's a really interesting article I saw today, I can't remember where it was, about the the pushback in Switzerland. So I think it's on Facebook, I can't remember which paper it's in, but okay. Um, so Switzerland has a very strong form of direct democracy, so everything can go to there was a basic income referendum there. So if you can get a certain number of people, you can have a referendum. They have national unity governments all the time, mm-hmm. so all the parties are in government together. It's, it's kind of a mess, and uh, there's been a a huge upsurge of far right um, rhetoric within politics and policies. A lot of very anti uh, Islamophobic stuff. A lot of of anti immigrant and so on. And uh, there's really interesting uh, response to that, saying, "Well, how have they started to address it?" And they said it was because they actually have started to just deal with policy. 
so the, the kind of liberal left or and center because it's not even just the left it's yeah even the center right to be honest here are, are disgusted at this as well i've gone do you know what we've played too long either of not saying anything it's like we discussed earlier you know we're not going to talk about immigration because you know people don't like it and so you allow them to dominate the discussion but there was an example used that uh, <coughs> the 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 Swede the swiss far right party wanted to introduce law that if you were had two criminal offences in Switzerland as a non-Swiss person, you were instantly thrown out of the country. And that could be that you you got a speeding ticket twice to get out of the country. <laughs> Whoa. And so they were like, this is this is disgraceful. But they didn't come back to it and say, right. this is racist and disgraceful. What they said was, how un-Swiss is that, that you would punish people for two minor offences? That is not how Swiss democracy works. And it was amazing how apparently even by the end of the campaign, the far right had stopped talking about it because the shift had happened so quickly. And I think that's where we need... To, I, I think for any of us who are not in the far right, there's this... We've been too complacent. Mm -hmm. We haven't realised the international link to this, this yeah. right movement across Europe, across North America. You know, you've got the Steve Bannons coming around, meeting with, you know, Rhys Mogg and, and people who are, you know, relatively, at least in his own head, senior in British politics. You've mm -hmm. got, you know, the far right in, in Eastern Europe. So there's a, that that global networking of it, I think we've been very complacent about. Mm -hmm. And I think yeah. there needs to be the, the active challenging of that. And I think in Scotland, our problem is we take for granted that we don't have that problem and it's always been much smaller. That's a dangerous complacency mm -hmm. because it doesn't mean it couldn't be bigger. We have the communities yeah. who have exactly the same disconnects. I think they've tended to find other outlets so I think, you know, it's, it's not surprising that, for example, in recent years, um, kind of the Yes movement has found a lot of support within those disconnected communities. Yeah. And I think, you know, wherever you stand on the Constitution, I think the Yes movement is a, is a positive space yeah. as opposed to the far right that we're seeing. Brexit in England. Yeah. Exactly. It's the same thing. But that doesn't mean that you couldn't have people coming in and framing it within that way. Oh God, you know, Scottish time, nationalism has, has tended to be a civic yeah. nationalism. Yeah. That doesn't mean someone can... Like Alistair Manipulator. Allen talking about blood and soil. This is where we... You know, and yeah, I, I, mean, I think that's where we need... You know, I, I refuse even with uh, with all that's going on in the world, I refuse to be anything but a, an optimist. It takes a, mm. a hell of a lot more effort nowadays. Mm -hmm. But actually, it has to be... A, it can't be passive... I think that's the danger is the kind of presumption of, you know, it'll get better. We'll get yeah. through this. Mm -hmm. Actually, it needs to be a very proactive and, and, uh, and you know, an, an optimism that needs to be willing to actually fight back against some of the mm -hmm. stuff yeah, that's, yeah. that's coming up against I was it. listening to, um, I don't know if you've ever listened to Blind Boy. You know, he's a, he's a musician, but he's got a podcast. Um, it was quite an interesting uh, podcast. He was saying that he thinks that... the, the Irish film? Yeah. The Rubber Bandits? Um, Rubber Bandits, that's it. Um, he thinks that the the best indicating sci-fi movie of the 80s, so he was like, he listed, he was like Blade Runner, Star Wars, Star Trek, he listed <coughs> a few, and he said that he thinks that the, the best prediction was made in Big, the Tom Hanks <laughs> movie Big, okay, and that uh, the rejection of the suit and the, the kid, all the kid wanted was to become an adult and get all these, I want to go to work yeah, and yeah. Do all these things. But after he'd done it for like a month, he went, do you know what, I want to be a kid again and yeah. I want to just go back and fuck being an adult. Let's yeah. just go back to being a child. It's so much better. Um, and that he'd sort of analysed what ha what has happened since the 60s, that the, the yuppies rejected the hippies and then Generation X rejected the yuppies in favour of like Kurt Cobain and like ripped yeah. jeans and what, and then hipster cultures come in and gentrification are like Brooklyn and all the, the major cities. He said that he thinks that the next generation is going to be a social justice generation and that social justice is going to be the big push that happens over the course of the next 10 years. Um, and obviously basic income, I think, will be... Yeah. A real big. I mean, it's a social justice. It, it can Look be it. painted as a social justice sort. Look at we've got sort our, of policy. our kids striking from school about climate change. Yeah. I find it fascinating this week with the you know the the lovely weather in Scotland, and it's been fascinating. I have three kids, and uh, my youngest is a baby, but the other two we've been talking about uh, climate change and and political activism, all coming from them. Mm -hmm. And uh, a they've come to the conclusion that basically old people have screwed up the world for them. Yeah, it's kind of like there's really not much I can yeah, say against it. Right. Yeah, um, but <laughs> other also, other than um, it, 
it's not our fault. Like mm-hmm. it's the politics of yeah. the, the, the sort yeah, of the boomers that's they generalise yeah, everybody. Like, if you're you, above the age if, of yeah, 10 it's, it's almost like well, if you're you've basically just kicked it down the road for me to deal with yeah, rather than you much. fucking dealing with it. Why yeah. did you not deal with it at the time? Um, but yeah, the, but this idea that again, <coughs> you know, it's it's like the old cliche of you're not born racist. You know, yeah. this is the point. We have generations, and I think. I think that the the interest and the growth and the connection into social justice, I think, is is absolutely there. I think we've seen it in in work we've done at the RC around uh, self employment that within young people, the the pushes around people want to create their own ideas and they don't want to just then sell them on to the highest bidder. They want to have social impact. You yeah, know, people want enough money to survive, mm-hmm. and then they want to do interesting stuff. That's you know, it's it's human psychology. And mm-hmm. I think what we need to do is find the ways to actually support and encourage that. And to me, that's where a basic income gives that that room for people to, to have that space. Mm-hmm. Um, I think the, the danger is that we have that generation get disillusioned before they have the chance to change. Yeah. I think there's more than, I mean, I, 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 again, on another episode last week, we commented on the, the climate change protesters seeing, you know, sort of young women, young, young girls mm-hmm. in handcuffs and stuff like that was crazy. Um, but I think again in America you're seeing similar things with like um, you know the the youth and gun legislation. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think I read somewhere that in the last um, the last eighteen months or something like that uh, they've passed some like seven or eighty separate you know gun legislation bills all across America, and it was the most since I think mm-hmm. Sandy Hook or whatever it was in two thousand and fourteen. You know, like that's all been driven by yeah. these you know young people who have. You know, being victims themselves to a certain degree, but uniting with other mm-hmm. students and other sort of like-minded youngsters as well, and I think it's, it's making a difference. It does absolutely, and I mean, I think you see as well. I, I was both depressed and <laughs> loved the fact. So I don't know if you saw recently. There was a group of young people met with Diane Feinstein, the Californian senator. Yeah, and uh, she kind of dismissed their concerns. It was brutal. I was. It was, it was horrific. Terrible, terrible. But she said eventually, you know, a. You didn't vote for me, so I don't really care. And B, um, which is really long-term voter encouragement. But also she said something I think about, you know, well, you know, if you think this is, is so important, then you should just grow up and run for Senate yourself. And I love the fact that the, the young women just looked at and went, I will. And you could just see straight away, because it wasn't that, you know what, you've put me in my place and I have to go home and sit. And it was like, like, you know what, yeah, you're, I, for your I will be there. Day. And this yeah. is a disgrace. And I think, you know, you are seeing that. I, th- I think um, the the... Democrats are in a, in a really challenging position because of the the kind of the split between Democrats, socialists, and and yeah. the kind of centre of the party. And actually, in some ways, they need to find ways to come together because I think too much. We've seen similar split. things in you know Labour Party, yeah, Tory Party, the Independence. You're seeing suddenly new on. people coming through who are exciting, and, and you know people of colour, people um, of different sexualities, different religions. You've got Native mm. American representatives so now. You've got in America too. Uh, congresswoman elected who were refugees yeah. you know what I mean, I mean like, but I think the the demographics and the ideologies of party politics are definitely changing and we've we've discussed this a few times on the show and I think it's, it's weird to actually see it starting to come mm-hmm. into fruition you know obviously recent events in, in, in Britain with the, the independent group but uh, again in America like one of the most vocal um, sort of objections that I hear from America in relation to the, the last of Cortez and some of the more sort of like, as you say, social democratic left guys, uh, comes through within the Democratic Party. I mean, Nancy Pelosi has kind of made a bit of a kind of side gig, out of like throwing shade at the last of Cortez, uh, and you're like, these are these are guys in the same party. I think it kind of undermines that uh, or underlines that idea that I think the old parties are dying. I think there's we're coming very close to a time where we're going to need something completely new across the board in that respect as well. Yeah, which is uh, is challenging for people who have power. Because yep. if you're in that position, you know, I think it's it's a difficult one to get, you're gonna, to get into. You're going to take power away for yourself to just be more true to your ideology. Yeah, and Alexandra Casey cortez I mean, she she did the unforgivable. She ran against, you know, a party stalwart. Who, you know, it, for me, it was summed up, and I've heard this in Scotland before, um, you know, but it was summed up. There was a quote from a Democratic um, Party kind of official in, in New mm-hmm. York who said, the thing that we were most annoyed about with her was that she had the cheek to run and get elected for a post that other people had been waiting decades for. And it was that person. We've heard, I, I've heard this Wait in Scotland. If you've not, you know, Page uh, Jews you've not been working, knocking doors for 30 years, you don't deserve to get in. You know, the parties, 
are, are you know, for all that Labour Party in the UK has grown and the SNP picked up a lot of members after the, the independence referendum, they're not necessarily, I, a, I think both those parties will lose members because it's people who joined from a movement mm -hmm. and actually political parties by nature are compromises or they have to be if they're going to be successful. And so that's not what a lot of people are looking for. Yeah. Um, but also people don't want to be out knocking doors you know they, you don't they, need to do it anymore because we live in a different time and you can connect with people on exactly. twitter so if <clears throat> if somebody in the democrats was to say to me for instance you're not you're no chapman on doors like how many doors does trump chat zero yeah. he connected with people in the platform that they're accustomed to through facebook through twitter Just hire the then he went fine, you he know? went to stadiums yeah. fully these people yeah they came to him you exactly to yeah. him. so i think that 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 is like one of the things where the old politics is sort of like gripping on for absolute dear life mm -hmm. to this old way of campaigning and getting yourself out there we'll definitely no realizing that it's 24 7 now yeah right. it is 24 7 there's a lot of celebrity that's struggled with this yeah, idea yeah. that <laughs> you need to shift for, away from Right, get the makeup on, smiling, waving. Fifteen minutes away, I go. Nobody really knows much about me. Tate, now everybody knows everything about you, so you need to adjust. Yeah. It needs to adjust. And I think there's been a few attempts at that that have failed miserably, particularly in the the American politics. I think I've seen a video of Elizabeth Warren making like stewing totties in her kitchen with a beard and stuff like that, like trying to chat to people on Instagram but, uh, and whatnot. It's and insincere. Like, it's oh really God, insincere. It's horrible. But when that type of thing happens and it's sincere. Mm -hmm. Oh, then you're like, like yeah, that, that's a, that's but fine. They, they said about the independent group, there was the analysis because they put the pro, the picture up of them all in Nando's. Nando's. Oh. They were like, how many hours will they have spent going right? Well, we can't go to McDonald's because that's a bit too cold. We can't go to this place; that's <laughs> a bit too posh. You know? Compromise, <laughs> exactly. I liked that the first Nando's. reply to their uh, their tweet was a guy saying that you have paid for bottled water when they give out free water in Nando's. So it's just like, yeah, <coughs> that's getting claimed back. I like, there's, no way that they're paying that. Way. there's no way that that Nando's bill is getting paid out of somebody's pocket. <laughs> um, we're just asking every, I mean, we've been well over, we're about an hour, approaching an hour and a half, but we're asking every guest really just to sort of give us a bit on how they feel about Brexit. I think what we'll probably do is put the podcast out as normal, but we'll probably just cut them up. and. Sure approaching we were talking before off mic approaching the date when we're supposed to leave not the extended yeah, date yeah. we'll just put out wee shots so just what people are saying yeah. what's your feelings on brexit so are we talking about brendan rogers or uh, <laughs> uh, so, <laughs> no let's so. not talk about brendan rogers no, no uh, we did so that already. i think although we should have called that brexit <laughs> I, I, unfortunately i, I think it brexit. was the sun that used that as their headline wasn't it yeah so, right, so that's why um, it's been stolen yeah uh, no i so for me i think brexit is uh is just a complete and utter mess from start to finish i think whilst it's been pushed by a small group of, of who have a very strong ideology and, and desire behind it. And frankly, who, a lot of them stand to make quite a lot of money out of it. Mm. I think overall, it's been a, a case of people who have no idea what's going on, trying to deliver something they don't know what they want and they don't really know how they're doing it. And we've just gone to that base of if we can leave it as close to the deadline as possible, then people will just have to, to fall in line. Yeah. Um, I think it's fundamentally undermined the UK's position in the world. I think even if it was scrapped now, I think you can't go back on that. Yeah. I think uh, it's it's shown up. Well, I think it was <clears> becoming <throat> ever more obvious. You know, the UK has traded on its historical prominence rather than its, its current position, mm -hmm. I think. But um, it has fundamentally undermined that. I think it has shown up fault lines in society. I think some that we've, we've discussed previously around communities that have been left behind. Mm -hmm. I think one of the things that scares me most about Brexit is the idea that for some of those communities, this has been sold on the basis of our problems have been caused caused by the EU. And if we just deal with that, then everything will be hunky-dory. Yeah. When it isn't, who do we blame next? Because it won't be the Johnsons or the, the Farage just standing up going, do you know what, guys? Yeah, we were we were wrong. It will be the next people. So will it be you know people of colour living in the UK? Will it will be mm. those who don't look enough like us? Will it be the Scots and the Welsh? Will it be you know the London yeah. folk? Or they're not London folk. It's it, you know it's that danger of, of taking us down a route of who do we who do we blame for our problems? Now this um, type of politics requires an other. And it does. The other's no longer the EU. Who does that other become? You know what it I mean? does, and I, I I think it's yeah. I think for me it's it's showing up that we've we've had that that gap in the willingness of us all to to fight back against that. I think we've we've taken for granted that overall, you know. So we, we attack mm -hmm. at the end of the day. 
the, you know, Cameron history will judge him strongly for this because yeah. he failed us. You know, Theresa May has been a disgrace as a prime minister, but mm-hmm. it's, it ultimately wasn't her fault. Cameron she yeah. set a record for how many times she gives the one Brexit speech, though. Oh, it's, you it's, know what I mean. Like, well, she keeps saying simple. I don't even know why she needs the paper in front of it anymore. She must have read that yeah. script. As a remainer, do you think that she's been? I've heard a lot of this. I don't really. I, I don't think so. I don't know. But do you think she's been purposely put there to sabotage it? Do you know what I was saying earlier about conspiracy theories? Because I never believe them. And there was that one that she yeah, she was there to sabotage it. And you know the way she's behaved. At some point, she's like, I can see where that goes. Mm-hmm. In the same way that there's an argument that Corbyn was put in as to sabotage the other side. Mm. Um, I, I don't think so. I think the issue is that. I think, much as we had actually with Cameron, the fundamental driver has been about retaining power and retaining control of the Conservative Party. Yeah. And that takes over from any other consideration. And so you're hearing it from Conservatives, you know, that the concessions to the ERG have been above and beyond anything that should have ever been made. And oh. yet they are the, the defining force, even though they are a small proportion in their own right. And I think that has been... Has been the issue, and I think that's been reflected then on on the other side as mm. well. Uh, I think there's been this idea of, you know, Caroline Flint. I think was saying it yesterday from a Labour perspective. We were given instructions as Parliament, and it's like, well, it's not how Parliament works. Yeah, um, it's like know. a misrepresentation of uh, democracy. Yeah, absolutely, and I that's mean, all a, sort of it's anti-democratic. And you're like, well, it happened in 2016. We're on 2019, so in a general election. <clears throat> Point. We're only twelve months away from a revote, so yeah, why can't we have another? We vote? have a representative democracy. <clears throat> that's our, our system. But also, you know, we we had the things recently in the court case that said, um, actually, had this been a legally binding vote, it would have been struck down because of the the failings within it. But it can't be struck down yeah, legally I mean, because it's not a legally binding vote. It's merely a, a guidance. A, a judi- um, that was a, a judiciary. Mm. advisory. Advisory. Yeah, you know, referendums. The the problem. They're terrible. Terrible. Binary decisions are just ridiculous. Yeah, the, I, I mean, even so much, everything was wrong about it, even down to the question, you know what I mean? And it's going to be interesting to see. I mean, for me, when you talk about, obviously, the, the Tories, their internal struggles and whatnot in relation to the Brexit, like, for me, on the other side of it, like, we're, as you say, th- you know, 2016 to 2019, nearly three years down the line, and, like, I still don't know where the Labour Party stand on Brexit. Like, so they're talking about, oh, we're going to have a second re- vote, Will it be Remain? Will it be No? Will it be Brexit? Do no deal? Theresa May's deal? Like, and I'm like, kind of looking at my watch going, so there's like 20, 28 days, 27 days allegedly to go until Brexit, and it's almost as if the Labour Party have just like woke up, you know, dozed off on the end of the benches mm-hmm. and went, oh, oh I you know think, what I mean? Like, yeah. uh, oh, I don't know where, vote. I don't know where the, the, where Corbyn's like ideas, I think it's been give them enough rope, yeah. let them let them like maul each other through within, mm. and it'll kill the Tories and it'll allow me to come in and take over. And, yeah, and I saw I'll, a, I'll be leader. I saw an article recently that said you know, there's a lot of talk about is you know, Corbyn secretly a Brexit and all the rest. And it's like, actually, th- this argued that it's more he doesn't care, he sees the EU as a bit of a pain. He doesn't really, he, he has things he doesn't like about it. He doesn't really care about it. What he wants is to be prime minister. And yeah. this is a route towards becoming prime minister. Mm-hmm. Uh, the problem is that, again, that's going down the same path that the Tories have. And what mm-hmm. we have seen here is, you know, a, a badly constructed political decision-making process influenced heavily, as we've seen by, um, you know, false claims and, and yeah. you know, use of, of media and, and social media sources leading to, frankly, two major parties who are using it for their own political gains, gains and, yeah. and, and losses and, you know, are playing out what we've discussed yeah. around the, the changing nature of party political systems, but actually at the same time taking the country off the edge of a cliff with it. And I think that's, um, I, I think the law will be judged pretty harshly mm. for this, whatever it gets to, because I think, you know, the, it, today they're, they're pointing out that the UK government cannot confirm how bad a no deal Brexit would be. They actually do not. So they, they, they've estimated a 9% hit to the, the UK economy. Yeah. That's, but that doesn't include yeah. any of the transitional impacts. It doesn't include other mm. things that come into this. So their, their general thing is, we know this is going to be awful. We just don't know how awful. And yet, you know, the concept that any 
government or opposition would be willing to take you down that path it is bizarre. Uh, you know, if they had a clear, if they were saying we're doing this because do you know what, we like we're happy with nine percent impact on the economy because it will create this you know bastion of yeah. Britishness or whatever. Mm -hmm. But we're it's not even World that. War II an awful lot. Like, okay. We survived the war. We'll survive this. And you're like. You get that these are two completely different things yeah. that have absolutely no relation to each other. You know what I mean? Yeah. Well, it's weird. We survived the, you know, the Black Death, but we're not suggesting <laughs> yeah. that everybody will plague again. Yeah, are we? But you know, I, there's someone on Twitter started today the uh, the Brexit calendar. So like you would have an right. advent calendar. Right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> on the first day this. of Brexit, my uh, on the first day of March, Brexit gave to me a shortage of uh, essential drugs. Right. <laughs> you know. Um, was the the one I seen was uh, I opened the first uh, well, I don't know the first door in my Brexit calendar, and it was just somebody looking at an empty vase of insulin, yeah, an empty jar of insulin, like with a tear running down their face. And you're just like, okay. And surely, a lot of people need to wake up when you hear about stockpiling of drugs mm. um, and army being mobilised. <laughs> yeah, yeah. we talk about sort of, you're about talk about uh, you know. Um, kind of uh, martial law and, and mm -hmm. national rights. Yeah. These are kind of things we should never be hearing in no. any sort no. of, of political dialogue, you know. And uh, of course, there has to be some planning, and there has to be planning, and you know, and some of the planning's been fantastic. You know, let's mm -hmm. hire ferry companies who have no ferries, and I think <laughs> they've been hired for something else, haven't they? So, they had to pay. A, a, they had to pay a thirty million pound thirty million pounds to Eurostar because of whatever agreements in place. Um, to do with that and i think that that's probably a, a nice indicator to what we'll end up seeing as a whole load of agreements that are going to need to get broken because of brexit and we're going to need to pay compensation oh, so you're saying like the fallout nine percent hit to the economy but potentially another few percent on maybe even way more than nine well, percent it's, it's nine percent hit to the economy but then what does the future economy look like yeah. this yeah. nonsense about world trade organization rules you know we'll just fall into that and suddenly empire 2.0 you mean they were saying that on the wto rules in terms of import export that for wto rules to be implemented obviously every vehicle essentially needs to be searched uh, in terms of in import export and customs and they're saying that if for just the, the average traffic that comes through British ports on a weekly basis, if there was something like a 60 second delay in processing each individual car, so just purely 60 seconds of lorry or whatever it is that we're looking at, that the tailback into you know, France and beyond would be like six days. So if there's just a uh, well, yeah, 60 yeah. second delay per vehicle coming through ports, mm -hmm. there'll be vans and lorries sitting in Cali for a week. Do you think we'll get a people's vote? I don't know. Yeah, I don't. I don't know. Do you think we'll unwind like Brexit and? Not? If I <laughs> too difficult to make a prediction at this stage, I think it's getting so messy that I think either we will get a last minute agreement to May's deal because it'll be that or nothing else, or we'll get delay and eventually we'll get some sort of compromised I muddle that basically. That takes us out the EU in but terms of all the good stuff but actually free, keeps us in all yeah. the Yeah, all the um, free movement of people will stay and we'll just stay in the single market. I think the easiest market. way to solve it will be to get Boris Johnson and Michael Gove along with Jeremy Corbyn and his, you know, Guy McConnell and just have them stripped to the waist in Parliament Square and fight to the death and whoever wins just, they get to implement their Brexit vision. <laughs> that would be the easiest way to do it at this Theresa point. Theresa May would win. She would just walk in halfway through and just <laughs> kill them all. Wait, would run, everybody's they... passed it on the floor and then take the crown. <laughs> they would run away. Uh, <laughs> uh, run away uh, you know, there's a reason the, the phrase may you live in interesting times is actually a curse rather than a blessing. It's, um, <laughs> it's just, it's an absolute mess and a disgrace you know I, th I think the cartoon that summed up best was the one after it had the u.s election and uh you know there's the thing about uh oh my goodness america has carried out the worst act of you know self-harm in the history of a nation and they just cut to a picture and it was the uk going hold my pint yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and i was like you know this is just self it's no far wrong as harm it's like a self-destruct button has been hit into it and but we're happy for some reason. We seem to be happy. I mean, there was a, a video where a guy that was saying that the reason he voted for Brexit was to stop people from coming from Africa and the Middle East. And like, they realise that they still get the same rules as before Aye, Brexit. That's no part of Europe. Yeah, and Aye. that the majority of people don't come from there. The immigrants that come to this country, and it, it it is. I think that sums it up for me is that it's like the some 
quite intelligent people have come up with some ridiculous arguments to convince some less intelligent people that this is the right thing to do. My um, favorite unfortunately, unique. you know, yeah. I mean, I'm no shitting on the, the guy that said that or anybody that cites immigration mm. as a reason for voting Brexit because they are just being convinced. They've, no, they've been, been absolutely hoodwinked into thinking that this is yeah. what we need to and do. And we've not had the discussions around country. it to actually mm. talk about what that and, means. In that respect, the one I love the most, and it's been it's been a favourite of mine I've seen a few times over the, the last year or so with Brexit, it's a guy who's a florist, and he's talking about, you know, I, I voted for Brexit. I'm like, okay, why? And he's like, I, I never really thought about it at the time. And he's like, so what's the impact on it now? And he's like, well... My entire business is almost exclusively imp imported from Holland. <laughs> like so, as much as maybe going with fresh flowers is no high on everybody's priority. That's that guy's entire livelihood. And like he's potentially up in smoke yeah. overnight, and he's going. I, I did this to myself, and you're like, yeah, mm -hmm. ouch. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. Well, on you that, I think we, we could just well, end it note, yeah. <laughs> cheers, <laughs> on that, a happy note, because we've just done 15 minutes on Brexit. And that's what I was looking for. So, uh, cheers for coming on again, man. No, it was great. Like, it was good. Good conversation. And, Absolutely. Um, I love hearing about it. I mean, basic income is one of these ones. When I seen the the Joe Rogan, he'd spoke to somebody else about it, and I think this guy would recommend yeah, to get yeah. the guy Andrew on. When I seen the podcast, basic income, I was like, Finally, like we're seeing it in the mainstream. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Joe Rogan gets more views than any news outlet in the planet. I think it's something like in twenty four hours, five million people would watch that podcast. Yeah. So yeah. that's a, that's Amazing, a hefty right? number. Yeah, yeah. And that's just YouTube. Aye. So then he's got his iTunes download, yeah, which yeah. is in the tens of millions as well. Aye. So So as soon as um, you get that into that kind of that format, that's where the, the discussion needs to be. So. Yeah. But again, thanks for coming in. No, no, any time. And you're welcome on so. any time. And yeah, yeah, hopefully yeah. we take some recommendations of people to get on. Cool. Yeah, it began. Cheers, man. Cheers. Thank you.